Who are the Jehovah Witnesses? Now, many of us in here who know anything about this organization might right offhand just agree that they are a cult. We might not have too much problem with this. Many of us who know anything about their organization, if you know and you have studied anything about them in reality, you would come to the conclusion that they are a cult, a cult. And there are many cults that have cropped up in recent days and recent years, within the last hundred, within the last hundred years, we've seen many cults and cult leaders, and and so forth, come and go. The Jim Jones thing is well known. The David Koresh thing is well known. The Moonies are well known. One after the other, we've seen them come and go. So, in my view, the Jehovah Witnesses meet that same description as a cult, and not only in my view, but in the views of those who specialize in cults such as Dr. Robert, Ma Rob uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Ma uh, Martin, I think his name is, Martin, Walter Martin. He's a Christian uh, uh, person who specialize in, specializes in cults, and he has labeled them as a cult, and they have now sought to defend themselves from that charge. So basically, let me just give you a brief overview of their organization, and then we'll get into some points uh, that have a, that we have a problem with not only we as Muslims, but mainstream Christianity has a problem with them as well in terms of their doctrine, doctrines and so forth. Now they were once called Russellites as a nickname because the founder was one Charles Taze Russell, and they were known as Russellites. However, they were a little more smarter than our Christian brethren, because our Christian brethren were given the name Christians in Antioch. They were called Christians, yet they adopted the name and kept it and sought to give a meaning for the name, you see, for the name, meaning Christ-like or whatever, to mean Christ-like or even followers of Christ. So they kept that name. It was a nickname that was put on them, and it was made in mockery. The name was given them in mockery as if to say, these are those people who follow that false messiah. Look at these guys, they're Christians, following the false messiah. So they just adopted the name and kept it for themselves. However, when they were called, these uh, people who follow in Charles Taze Russell were called Russellites, they said, nah, we don't want that. We're not Russellites. So get rid of that. So eventually that died out. Or well, maybe they might still today would have been called Russellites. The movement known as Jehovah Witnesses was initiated by Charles Taze Russell in 1872. 1872, he was 20 years old at the time, 20 year old young man in 1872. And he was the first president there and it was known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Charles Taze Russell was born in 1852 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. His parents were Presbyterians. This was their faith, Presbyterians. But he joined a con the Congregational Church because it was more liberal. Many of the doctrines of the church were un was, was unacceptable to him, particularly predestination and eternal punishment. Predestination, he didn't, he didn't come to grips with the, with the church doctrines on predestination and eternal punishment, that one would be in hell five for eternity. He, didn't, he couldn't come to grips with that. And so by the age of 17, he had lost faith both in the Bible and in the church. In 1870, the 18-year-old Russell attended a meeting of a handful of what was called Second Adventists, Second Adventists, Second Adventists, the meaning those people who believe who believe in the second and were waiting for the second advent of Christ, peace be upon him, the second advent of Christ. Now, I don't know if the modern day Seventh Day Adventists stemmed from that movement or not, and it's something I will probably look into to see, 
but these people call themselves Second Adventists. He attended that meeting and he listened to the teachings of the Second Adventists and, fought and, fr and found them sufficient to reestablish re his wavering faith in the divine inspiration of the Bible. He kind of liked what he heard at some of those meetings he went to. With his faith restored and his curiosity aroused, Russell and five others began a systematic study of the Bible together. He got some people together and says, look, you know, let's go over to my house one night and maybe your house one night and let's just have a Bible study group, a Bible study group. But we want to do a systematic approach to the study of the Bible. How about you? You okay? okay? Yeah, so he got these handful of people together and that's what they began doing. And one of the main conclusions at which they arrived was that Christ's second coming was to be invisible. Christ's second coming, they came to uh, agree and to get this understanding from their systematic study of the scripture that the second coming of Christ, peace be upon him, was to be invisible. He was to come invisible in the spirit. And that was contrary to what the second Adventists were teaching. So now we can put a stop right here. Put a stop right here and say, well, you know, this is what your pastor, Charles Taze Russell, this is what he was studying. He was a young man. So he was studying now and he came to this conclusion. And now for the last hundred and some odd years, you've been holding this position from this young man's mind, from his study. You haven't questioned it. You haven't looked at research. You haven't seen anything different than that to say, oh, maybe he was wrong. You've just been sucking that right down, the, the, your windpipes. So as soon as I looked into this matter right away, I said, oh, that's not correct. That's not correct. Because according to Mark, chapter 14, verses 61 and 62, it contradicts that position. And I don't know why they don't see it. It's right there. Contradicts that position. Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62. They believe the second, the second advent of Jesus, peace be upon him, is to be invisible. As a matter of fact, now they believe that he came in 1914 and established the kingdom he's reigning right now. You know, he's here already. But look what it says there in Mark chapter 14, verse 61 and 62. When he's being interrogated by Pilate, and he was asked, Art thou the Christ, son of the blessed? Art thou the Christ, son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see. What? Ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Not invisible, isn't that right? He says, I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand. You shall see that. You don't see anything invisible, isn't that right? And sitting on the right hand, so you'll notice the right from the left hand, if it's, like, if it's getting technical like that. Well, if he, he, he's sitting on the right hand, and he's coming in, cloud, in the clouds of heaven. So you'll be able to see the clouds, I'm sure. That's something you can see clouds. And so you'll see him as well. There. So this contradicts this concept of an invisible second coming. In 1876, Russell joined forces with a Dr. Nason, uh, Nelson rather, H. Barber, who also had his own study group. However, as a result of the doctrinal differences, two years later, Russell and Barbara parted companies. It's carrying on like Paul and Barnabas. You know, they're hanging out for a while and then they can't agree, and so they says, Lakundi, Lakun, Willie, you dean. You know, you go your way and I go mine. Russell decided to publish a magazine of his own. And on July 1st, 1879, the first issue of Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Present appeared. 
as the Watchtower magazine, what they have now, the Watchtower magazine, before it was called Zion's Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence. As the Watchtower magazine, it has been published without interruption ever, ever since. And witnesses distribute a billion pieces of literature, literature annually. Isn't that something? A billion pieces of literature annually. That's what they distribute. A billion pieces. With the publication of the Watchtower and the intensive evangelism evangelizing campaign embarked on throughout the world and throughout America in the world rather congregations began to be established in many major cities the end times prediction because they have they have made so many predictions and I'm not going to deal with most of those tonight many uh, any of those really uh, but they had made so many predictions in 1914 that the world was going to come to an end in 1925 and 1975 until ev eventually they stopped doing that now. They stopped making those predictions because they all proved to be false. When I don't know how they could have made them in the first place because the Bible says of that day of the hour knoweth no man, neither the father nor the son, neither the angels nor the, nor, I mean neither the angels in the heaven nor the son, but only the father. So how could they have been making predictions about the end of the world with that verse sitting right there in front of them? So those predictions failed, resulting in much uh, heart search searching and rebellion among the society. People started rebellion, rebelling because people had been selling their homes, selling their farms, not going to school, uh, not getting married, and one thing after the other, thinking that the world was going to come to an end, waiting around, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. This decadent, decadent condition was, so, uh, was also further accelerated by the death of Russell on October 31st, 1916, on a train near Pampa, Texas. So when he died, just like the Nation of Islam with the death of Elijah Muhammad, more chaos came about. I think we, we're going to take a break now to change this tape. Is that correct back there? Okay, we're going to take a break and we'll have a tape change and show on. Alhamdulillah, we're back online. We have changed the tape and we continue, inshallah. On January 6th, 1917, Judge Joseph Franklin Rutherford Russell's personal lawyer for some years was chosen president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Now, although he was called judge, he was not really a judge, but they called him Judge Rutherford. And on July 26, 1931, at 4 p.m., Rutherford read a, read, read a resolution before an assembly Watchtower convention at Columbus, Ohio, which called on them to accept the new name, the new name Jehovah's Witnesses. 1931 is when they acquired that name, and he himself made that resolution that they be called Jehovah Witnesses. Rutherford died at Beth Sarim on January 8, 1942, after a long illness. For some years, the Watchtower Society became so negative to other faiths that it refused to classify Jehovah Witnesses as a religion. Now we know that they, I don't know why they refuse to classify themselves as a religion. Sometimes, you know, you'll ask people today, you'll see, uh, what religion do you belong? They say, well, I don't really belong to a religion. I don't really practice a religion. You know, because now they're getting these new concepts that, you know, you're trying to pin them in or tie them down with some concept of religion. So now they want to break out and they're beyond that. So there's no way you can corner them with anything because I don't really practice a religion. It's like some free thought movement or something like that. Yet the same people will call themselves, in most cases when I deal with them, they're opposing people or they're people of the other side of the fence, they're Christians. But these are people evidently who are not really practicing their Christianity or their religion. They're the new thinkers. So they feel that there's something up your sleeve. So they want to say, we're not following religion. Yet they have a Bible in their hands. So I said, well, what about James chapter 1 verse 26? And 27, James, 
chapter 1, verse 26, 27. It says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is vain. Pure religion, he goes on to say. What is correct and pure religion? And undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. We know the term religion means to walk before God godly. It's a way of life, religion, to walk before God godly. Good behavior before God, not just a ceremony, because he's thinking that maybe it's just a ceremony, you know, religion, ceremony. In the Quran, pure religion is also defined. In the Quran, chapter 4, verse 125, it says, And who is better in religion than he who submits himself entirely to Allah while doing good to others? and follows the faith of Abraham, the upright one. Who is better in religion than he who submits himself entirely to Allah, surrenders his will to the will of God, while at the same time he does good to others and follows the faith of Abraham, the upright one, because we know we consider him major religions today, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, as the father of religion, the father of monotheism, so to say. And James, in James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. You know, one thing about James' epistles, if you ever get a chance to read it, you would think that you're reading some Islamic literature. If you read the epistle of James, you think you were reading Islamic literature. And therefore, Luther called James' epistle what? An epistle of straw, Martin Luther. He calls James' epistle an epistle of straw. Why? Because it does not preach salvation through the cross. Check it out sometime, James' epistle. You have to earn your salvation. James, no salvation through the cross. Major doctrines about Jehovah's Witnesses now. Let's move on. The Bible uses the word, uh, the word or names Elohim, Adonai, and Chiros in reference to God. But the Jehovah Witnesses feel that the Almighty God must be distinguished by the name Jehovah. Jehovah. This is what they feel that God should be called, Jehovah. So, I bring the attention to the term, and you look in any Bible dictionary, this is a dictionary of the Bible uh, by Hastings. It's a well-known dictionary. And they say under the word Yahweh, they say the, pronunci the pronunciation of Jehovah has no authority at all and appeared only in late medieval times. The pronunciation Jehovah, no authority for that. It is an attempt to vocalize the tetragrammaton using the, uh, this, the YHWH, using the vowels written under it by the scribes, which vowels, however, were never intended to be combined with the four consonants of this word. That the pronunciation is in ancient times was Yahweh is concluded from the transcriptions in the early Christian fathers. So that word, according to any dictionary, not just this one, you can look in any dictionary for the term Jehovah. There's no authority for pronouncing Jehovah as such. And we'll get into that in a few minutes. I have a folder here on the divine name, and I'll deal with that a little more. As Christians, the, uh, uh, Christians, the witnesses believe that Jesus is the Christ. They believe that. They believe, too, that Jesus had a pre-human existence prior to his birth on earth. They believe that before being born on earth, he existed uh, uh, in, in, in somewhere else. Let's we'll say for the sake of uh, argument, heaven. Rather than the second person of the Trinity, he was a second God, they say. They don't believe he was the second person of the Trinity, but he was a second God. A second God. Jehovah Witnesses, you know, they translate the John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was a God. The Word was a God. Jehovah's Witnesses deny the doctrine of the uh, hypostatic or the union or incarnation, the God-man concept. They deny that concept as defined by the creed of Chalcedon. The idea that Christ was both holy God and holy man, they deny that. They don't believe that. 
Although to, the, to them Jesus was the Son of God throughout his existence and has been the Son of Man since his human birth, he became Christ or Messiah only at his baptism when he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. According to their belief, the Jehovah Witnesses, when Jesus died as a man, his human nature perished. The witnesses point to several scriptures which show that he was raised as a spirit and not a man. He was raised when he died, he rose as a spirit and not a man. And they point to scriptures that certify that, such as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 said, He being put to death in the, in the flesh, meaning Jesus, he was put to death in the flesh as a mortal human being, put to death, but being made alive in the spirit. He was made alive in the spirit. But right away now, we say, ah, there's some problem with that text because it, st it stands totally in contradiction, totally in contradiction to Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Luke 24, 39, in a gospel account. This is a gospel account that's going to be in total contradiction to a, a letter, an epistle. And there Jesus, supposedly, when he came into that room with his disciples there, after the alleged death and uh, crucifixion and resurrection, he came in there and he says, Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see. Handle me physically so you can see that a spirit has no flesh and bone as you see me have. In other words, if I'm a spirit, if you think I'm a spirit, then handle me and check me out. Because if I was a spirit, if I had rose and I'm a spirit being, a spirit person, I would not have flesh and bone as you see me have. Flesh and bone as you see me have. So now one of those scriptures cannot be right. And further on, he goes on to prove that point by saying, have you here any meat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and honeycomb, and he did take it and ate before them as a demonstration. Before them, not with them, before them to show them, to prove something. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I think where they get that scripture from is when he tells Mary not to touch him because he has not yet ascended to the Father. This not that I'm where, agreeing with it, but that's where they get it from. This is where the uh, he says, Jehovah Touch Witnesses... He not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Uh, let's see. What scripture is that? I'm sorry. I can't remember it. Okay. Let's see if we can get it for you. John chapter 20, verse 17. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go unto my brother and say unto them, I ascend to my Father, and your Father, my God, and your God. Now, this is a contradictory also here. You know that. You're aware of it, right? I agree. Because they did touch him. Okay, so I don't have to go into that then. <laughs> Another scripture said that they touched him. Okay, that's no problem. Okay, now. Since 1882, Pastor Russell and the Watchtower Society has taught that the Holy Spirit is not a person. It is simply God's active force. Jehovah did, according to them, create through his son other spirit creatures, however. These are like the cherubs, they say, and the angels, etc. The witnesses note that only one of these spirits is referred to as an archangel, and that is Michael. They feel that because of his unique role as, as described in the Bible, this Michael, and because his name, this Michael, means who is like God, question mark. That Michael was and is the word, uh, is, is the word, the, res uh, the resurrected Christ, in other words. They believe that this archangel My Michael is actually Christ. Christ is that angel. This teaching gets stranger as you go along. The spirit of man, they teach, is simply the life force which might be likened to an electric current of a car battery. As one dies, so the other dies. When men die, their spirits are in no sense conscious. This, this means that the Jehovah Witnesses do not believe in hellfire or purgatory. They don't believe in hellfire or purgatory. They believe that you, the man is the soul. The soul is the man. He's one. When the man dies, the soul dies. 
They stress that the biblical hell it is mankind's common grave for which an individual can be res resurrected to either a heavenly or an earthly life. The term Gehenna and lake of fire as used by Jesus and in Revelation do not indicate eternal torment. Rather, they mean the second death, eternal, uh, eternal annihilation. Now, they have an organiz uh, organizational structure here which it just goes like this. In other words, to show their authority, how their uh, church or their uh, organization is, uh, is uh, authoritative, where the authority comes from, who is the top official and right on down to the low man. They say that Jehovah God is the top. Jesus Christ is next. Then the faithful and discreet slave class, which they quote from Matthew chapter 24, verses 45 through 47. The discreet slave class. Then they have the governing body, and then they, had a ch they, they have the uh, uh, writing committee, the teaching committee, the service committee, the publishing committee, the personnel committee, and one committee after the other that stems from that governing body. Now, when they orchestrate themselves, if you line up the Catholic Church and line them up next to it, you'll see it goes like this. The Pope of Rome would be equivalent to, uh, they, they would have an equivalent, the president of the Watchtower Society. He would be equivalent to the Pope of Rome. The College of Cardinals in the Catholic Church would be equivalent to their governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the governing body. The Papal Curia it would be their committee structure of the governing body. And the Vatican would be their Brooklyn Bethel, their headquarters downtown. The Archbishops would be the district overseers. The bishops would be the circuit overseers. The priests would be the elders. Deacons would be their ministerial ser servants. The regular order would be their pioneers, and the Catholic laity would be the Jehovah's Witness community. So this is the way they have their thing orchestrate, orchestrated. It's really like a bunch of bees or ants or something. They're well organized, well orchestrated. Everybody's got somebody always over you, always watching you, always checking you. Now, anybody who would want to dissent from them, <coughs> this is how they're dealt with. The Watchtower uh, Society has used a number of tactics to deal with dissent. In the first place, as early as 1978, it brought great pressures on those who within the organization who were re-examining basic witness doctrines, not to make any of their data known to the witness community. They were telling them, look, you know, you people here who are studious, who are uh, educated in this community here, and you feel now that you have to rethink some things and you're investigating some positions and doctrines and all that, first thing I'm warning you, don't you go mouthing that off to the general congregation, you know, because maybe they recognize you as somebody important and all that, and now you start mumbling and grumbling, then you're gonna get them mumbling and grumbling, you see? So if you got any personal thing and all that, you keep it to yourself and you deal with that for now. And I have a book here, which I'll get into, uh, hopefully, in a few. Let's see, where is this guy's book? This book here, which is something, if you can get your hands on, it's like a precious jewel called Crisis of Conscience. Crisis of Conscience. This is by Raymond Franz. Raymond Franz was a member of the governing body. A member of the governing body. That's the highest you can get in the organization unless you're the president. And his uncle, Fred France, was the president. His uncle, Fred France, was the president, and he was a member of the governing body. And he was a witness for 40 some odd years. But he had a crisis of conscience. He could no longer continue with these doctrines, and he was making most of them. We'll get into some of the things, how their, their doctrines come about. And I have books and stuff here that he wrote. Major doctrines that he taught that he implemented for them, that he orchestrated, that he wrote. And then if you go and ask the Jehovah's Witness today, you say, you know, you know Raymond France? They said, look, we don't want to talk about him. He's an apostate. I said, well, he made up all the beliefs. Most of them, the things that you study and that you believe, he's the man who made them up. And then later on, he had a crisis of conscience. said, look, these things are not right. You still accept that we accept the beliefs. He's considered him an apostate. We don't want to hear about him. I call this indoctrination. I call it brainwashing. But we'll get into some more of that later on. Somebody had a question? Raymond, yeah.
Now, after they've been told uh, that not to broadcast any of this information that they're studying, like this guy France, perhaps, to the lay community, then following the purge of the Watchtower of Brooklyn Bethel in the spring of 1880, they had a big house cleaning there. So look, we're going to get rid of a lot of these guys here. Too many mumbling and grumbling going on here. We're going to clean house. 1980. The society unleashed a series of attacks against any and all of the so-called apostate ideas proposed by Raymond Fran and his homeboy, his buddy, Edward Dunlap, and the small band of men and women who had been driven from the worldwide headquarters of Jehovah Witnesses. In religious context, one of the standard methods of treating uh, the dissonance caused by encountering people with different belief structures whose morality appeared to be so impeccable that they qualify as righteous. You know, you got a guy here who you might look at him, Raymond Fran, and you think, well, he qualifies as a righteous person. He's like a righteous person. So when he starts bugging out on us and spacing out on us and starts thinking for himself now and getting independent and coming up with his own concepts about things and pointing that maybe things ain't right, well, how do we tear his character down? You, we know he's well known in the community. He's an upright, righteous person. So how do we get to him? How do we discredit him? Well, they got a methodology to use here. What is it? They simply call this guy self-righteous. They call him self-righteous. Or even righteous in their own eyes. They say, you're just righteous in your own eyes. You're self-righteous. You see? Uh, we got a guy here now, you understand, he's a, he's a righteous guy, and he's well respected and all that, but we want to discredit him, so we put the word out that the guy is self-righteous. <laughs> now the people look at him and say, oh, that's why he's so righteous. He's self-righteous. He's got a flaw now. And that is what the Watchtower Society has done to anyone and all dis uh, who, who has dissented, even the slightest degree, from his teachings. The very expressions, self-righteous and righteous in their own eyes, have become standard witness phrases applied to anyone who is independent-minded. Independent-minded. They have a term now called shunning. Independent-minded. If you start thinking for yourself, thinking for yourself, righteous, self-righteous, you know that in the Quran, it's just the opposite. We're told, let there be no compulsion in religion. No compulsion in religion. Why? Because the truth stands out clear from error. You have to use your intellect and think. So nobody can compel you to believe in anything. Why? Because as a person with intellect, you can see that the truth stands out clear from error. In the September 15, 1981 issue of the Watchtower, witnesses were instructed to stop greeting particularly all disfellowshipped persons. Don't greet them anymore. Don't say, good morning, how you doing? How's your day? You see a guy that's been disfellowshipped now. He's been with you all the time. You've been, came into the organization maybe together, been doing field work together and going here together and doing one thing after the other, maybe 10, 15, 20 years. Children going to school together, raised up together. You come to each other's houses and dine and all that. And now because the guy starts to think, you know, I bumped into a uh, Catholic the other day and he was saying something. You know, I ran into this Jew, I ran into this Protestant Christian, and they were saying, yeah, you're Jehovah's Witness, you know, so on, so on, so on, so on. I ran into this Muslim, they said, uh, so on, so on. You know, and it made me think for a minute about these doctrines we have. You know, they suddenly said, you know, you believe that Jesus Christ uh, is going to come back invisible. Well, look in the Bible right there. It says, look, Pilate, the guy was told Pilate, says, look, we used to see the Son of Man coming. You know, what do you think about it? He says, no, we never seen that. He says, got to think about that. Got to think about that. So now the guy's starting to think. So now he's telling another friend of his, a Jehovah Witness friend, he says, you know, I ran into a Muslim guy the other day, and he pointed to me something in the scripture I think you need to look at. And then the other person goes and says, you better watch Sister So-and-So and Brother So-and-So over there because they've been talking to other people. You see, he's going to get some merit, you know, by blowing the whistle. You see? So now they call the person in and say, look, we're here that you've been so-and-so and so-and-so, if you don't put a stop to that, we're going to disfellowship you now, and if you keep going on, and we think you've been at it a while, okay, you're disbarred, you're banned, you're shunned. Disfellowship, and the word goes out. Sister so-and-so on, don't pay them no mind, don't talk to them. Isolate them, you see? 
Family members were to cut all, any and all unnecessary ties with relatives. However, there are other factors which cause most witnesses to, to remain loyal to the leadership in the society. Witnesses are a world, a world denying contrast group. They deny basically things of the world, things of the world. Which is, amazingly, which, which is amazingly isolated psychologically from the large societies in which they exist. In other words, whatever metropolis they live in and all of that, you will find them basically contrary to the basic fundamental things in that society. They send their kids to school, they don't salute the flag, they don't stand up for this, they don't stand up for that, they don't do many things we can agree with them on. We can agree with them on. Some of the so-called so, so uh, 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 traditional things that that people have you doing in respect of them and honoring them and homage perhaps pay, paid to them that is only due to God, uh, we can agree with them on. Like if I'm sitting in the courtroom and the judge walks in, all of a sudden I got to pop up like a jack-in-the-box because another man walked into the room. I got to pop up automatically like a jack-in-the-box. And then the guy says, sit down. I'm saying, what is that about? Who's this guy who just walked in? He probably just got through beating his wife or fornicating or lying and stealing like some of these judges do. So why would I be popping up for him? Or the guy says, take that hat off. So what is this about? Take that hat off. If the Pope comes in, he's got his little yarmulke thing on. The Jewish man got his yarmulke on. The Muslim got his little kufi on. And I got on a cap. He says, take yours off. So what is this about? You see, all these little things that we might have say, well, this is too much homage paid to another individual, a human being. What is this about? We don't know. So we can agree with them on some of these things. <laughs> Hence, the average witness is so preoccupied with the evils of this dying old world and his involvement in proselytizing his neighbors that he usually has little time to desire or examine his faith. He doesn't have too much time to be checking out nothing. Because when he gets up in the morning, many of you who go out to work, you'll see a Jehovah Witness at out 6 o'clock in the morning. 6 o'clock in the morning at the subway station or bus stop or somewhere. And if they're not there, they're headed there. They're headed there, 6 o'clock in the morning. You say, well, what in the world are these people standing out here for? And sometimes they're standing in places there ain't even no tra traffic. They're just there. They're just on post. They just got to be there. And they got to put out an hour or two hours of field work. They got to do that. So they're too busy doing that to be somewhere sitting now trying to say, well, look, let me check out some of these things that we're believing in. See how they compare with things other people say and do. Even should he wish to do so, he would be in danger of being dis uh, disciplined, marked or disfellowshipped and driven from the community as an apostate. Now, they have some techniques that they get into, and I don't want to bog down too much with this. There's so much stuff that you, you, I advise you to get some literature and read. I didn't have room enough in my bag to bring some of the kind of literature that will give you some insight into the organization from a critical perspective and from those who have been there and all that, but much of that literature is on the market, some uh, uh, sufficient and some more sufficient and more beneficial than other pieces, such as a piece by this gentleman here who was a member of the governing body. That's priceless, like almost, you get that piece. So now, but they have methodologies that they use, techniques that they use, and you'll see them every day. And once you study these things and you encounter them, you see them at, at work. You see how they respond. When you try to relate to them, why they don't listen to too much you have to say. And if you try to give them a track or a piece of literature or something, why they're not able to accept that? One thing after the other, what is the normal spiel that they have? Why is it that everybody's orchestrated to have the same thing? Why does everybody have the same literature? If you go out in Brooklyn in the morning and you go to Durban, South Africa, everybody's got that same booklet in their hand. And when the month is over, they pull it back all over the world. And a new piece of literature is given. Nobody's got one track today and another track today and somebody else got something different. Everybody has the same. And when it comes back, everybody's coming back. And everybody's orientated about what the next track is going to be and give you a little spiel on it, and it's orchestrated. Everybody, everybody has somebody over them. Somebody over you who's watching you, who's watching you, who's watching you right on down. Now, they have something uh, called a weekly uh, home Bible study. A weekly home Bible study. And this is how most Jehovah Witnesses have become Jehovah Witnesses. This is how they got into the organization, through this so-called weekly Bible study. 
You see, they come out on the street and they come to your house and they place. They have a placement day where they magazine work, where they go out and they place a magazine at your door. And then if you just look out, you'll see them write something down in a chart. If you, if you, they knock on the door, ring the bell, and give you a piece of literature, you just go to the window and look out, and you'll see that person look, and they're writing you down. They got you in the book, you see? Because now they have to do a callback. They do a callback to see if you've been studying that literature. And then when they do the callback, they try to get a home Bible study course going on with you for like an hour or something. Now, this weekly Bible study is the way in which almost all of the Jehovah's Witnesses have become members of the movement, generally lasting for an hour. It is based upon one of the society's publications, usually called Let God Be True. That's this book right here, Let God Be True, and it's from the scripture, and every man a liar. Because now they want to say, whatever God is saying, that's what it is. So they have a study like this here. They say, look, never mind all these doctrines and all these kind of things. Let God be the one that's true. So they'll bring this book out on you and open it up. And to make a long story short, you're thinking that you're getting a Bible study course but it's not a Bible study course in the sense what you think you're going to come and sit down and you're going to open your Bible and they're going to open theirs and you're going to have a mutual exchange of ideas and concepts and all that. No, it's not like that. It's not like that. They have their books. There's not Bible studies, book study. They're just quoting the Bible to support, it, to support what the book says. They quote the Bible to support the book's doctrine, but it's a book study. And every book has got a title, like the Paradise Book, the Reasoning Book, the This Book. If the book is called Reasoning from the Scripture, it's called the Reasoning Book. If it's the Paradise, How to Turn Eternal Life, it's called the Paradise Book. It's called the Green Book, the Blue Book, whatever book they have. And so this is what you'll be getting. You'll just think you're getting a Bible study, but you're not. And they'll come to your house and they'll say, well, you know, we only have a half an hour to say for that hour Bible study when they come. They, they allot themselves an hour. But they'll tell you that we only have a half an hour because if things are not going right, they're going to leave. But if they're going to write, they'll extend for the hour. And when they come to your door, at the, they have three minutes. Three minutes at the door to get some kind of a spiel that they have off. It's like a sales, sales game. And they've been taught when they knock on the door, ring the door, they ask their question. You see? Their question. They ask your question. Do you think the world's going to ever see peace? So now that's a lead-in question. You can answer it however you like. They have the next mode of uh, operation for you. And they got three minutes at the door to do whatever they have to do before they can move on. If they, you seem like a good customer, then they'll take some time with you, so forth and so on. So now, rather than to go further with that, let me just show you some points of problems uh, that they have that you can take note on that maybe you might want to question them about when you see them. And we talked about the divine name that they use. Now, they say that the name of God is Jehovah. However, we know that that, prop, that cannot properly be because in the Hebrew language, there's no J and there's no V. In the Hebrew language, there's no J and there's no V. So you can't pronounce anything Jehovah with a J and a V. There's no, pronounce, there's no alphabets in the language for that. Now, they have a brochure. Uh, entitled, The Name, The Divine Name That Will Endure Forever. The Divine Name That Will Endure Forever. You see, and I'm in the habit of some, anybody, whoever's got a track, whoever's got some material, whoever's got a flyer, I'll take it because I want to see what the next guy has to say. How can I relate to a person? How can I uh, deal with a person if I don't know what they're thinking and what they're saying? And if it's something I can benefit from, then I benefit from it. Not in a, in a sense of... Uh, uh, some scripture that's going to enlighten me because as a Muslim I believe we have all of the uh, uh, necessary enlightenment in the Quran. But there might be some statement, something there, some bit of knowledge about something that I can use. And if I can, we're taught as Muslim knowledge, the prophet of believers should claim it wherever he finds it. So I'll take it. But basically I'm taking it so I can know how to respond to you back and how to deal with you and what you're thinking, you see. So anybody's literature, I'll take it so I can compile much of this kind of literature. So now I can come back to them with their own books now and their booklets in the future. So now they talk about the name, the divine name of God, and they say God's name and its meaning and its pronunciation. And on, on page seven here, they says what? The truth is nobody knows for sure how, how the name of God was originally pronounced. The truth of the matter is, the truth is, I mean, if you want to tell the truth, 
They say nobody knows for sure how the name of God was originally pronounced. Nobody knows for sure. Nobody knows for sure. Okay. And then they have something here called the Watchtower. The Watchtower magazine. And this, mo this issue, you should try to get one. Try to get one if you can get a back issue. It's March. March, I don't think it's necessary. We have to film each one of these because it's taking too much time for me to hold for you to focus. We don't have to really cap capture all of this if you don't want. Uh, the, my camera crew here does such an excellent job. Uh, but meanwhile, it might take too much time now. March 1st, 1991. March 1st, 1991, the Watchtower. If you can get a back issue, if you know one of the Jehovah Witness friends in your neighborhood, ask them, do you have a Watchtower from 1991? It's a very devastating point it's mentioned in here. And in here, now how do I know about these magazines in 1991 and what's in them? Not that I'm so smart. No, <laughs> I'm not smart at all. <laughs> But I happened to be in California, and when I was in California, you know, whenever, wherever I go, I try to find where's their bookstore. If I have some time to spend, I go to the local bookstores because there's many things in other places that you can find that you can't find in your local communities and so forth. So I was in California, and I found this rare gem. I must say it's a rare gem. It's a rare gem. It says, Jehovah Witnesses Literature, a critical guide to watchtower publications. Why is it so valuable? Because, you know, any time you pick up a, a, a Jehovah Witness book, a piece of literature, a book, there's no author's name in the book. There's no author's name in their books. They don't give any authors. Written by, authored by who? Compiled by who? They don't tell you. Now, the early literature, the early literature, back in the days of uh, Russell and Rutherford, they had their names in there. And I have some of that real early, early literature here with Judge Rutherford's name in it and so forth. But now, literature like this here, and any literature that you find, no name in it. But so happens that this book here tells you the name and who wrote every piece of literature. Every piece of literature, who wrote it? And what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? They tell you, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with that piece of literature? Points that you can get the literature and you turn to and say, this is the problem with that literature. Look, get your hands on it. This piece of literature here. So I was able to get it, and I found out about this magazine here, and many others, many others. And there it says here about God's personal name. God's personal name. Okay. It says, at Luke chapter 4, verse 18, according to the New World Translation, Jesus applied to himself a prophecy in Isaiah saying, Jehovah's Spirit is upon me. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. Many object to the use of the name Jehovah here. It goes on to say, Scripture, the so-called New Testament, true, no early surviving Greek manuscript of the New Testament contained the personal name of God. Look at that. They say, no early surviving Greek manuscript of the New Testament contains the personal name of God. None. So why are they constantly putting Jehovah and they translating Jehovah in their manuscripts, in their Bible? You see, it just got, they have owned up to it right here. Just goes to show you that, again, they don't know what this name is. They have no uh, documentation for it. It's something that they have latched onto and now they're caught with it. Now, I have shown this Bible before, and this is the Lamsa uh, translation, translated from the ancient Eastern manuscripts. And there, after they tell you in the preface there about the language that Jesus, peace be upon him, spoke, that being Aramaic, even our Jehovah Witness brethren, they own up to that in their, in, their Bible, in their Bible here. They have the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. This is 1958 version. And they say Aramaic. It says uh, uh, Aramaic influences. Besides this, the Christian Greek Scriptures quoted uh, some words in Aramaic, which was the language 
that Jesus of Nazareth com commonly spoke. They admit to that. He, he commonly spoke Aramaic. So I asked him, I said, well, if Jesus spoke Aramaic, what did, what did he call God in his language? In his language. How did he pronounce the name God in his language? So here, they tell us here in this book here, which is a Bible version here, they say English names and their Aramaic equivalents. English names and their Aramaic equivalents. And for God, for God, G-O-D, they have A-L-A-H. A-L-A-H-A. Allah. Ha. Allah. Ha. Allah. Ha. Now we know in pronouncing in Arabic where the name is Allah. Who. Allah. Who. But the vowel who, the dhamma on the end of Allah, is dropped when you stop the name there. It's only continue when you say Allah Hu Akbar. But when you say drop, when you drop the, when you stop just at the pronunciation of name, that last vowel drops. So I'm assuming that it's going to be the same case here, and that that last a sound is going to drop, and it's going to be Allah. Simple as that. Very simple. It's very clear here. It's right there. This is not anything from any Muslim. This is clear. The language is Aramaic. Yes, sir. This is the Lamsa, Lamsa translation of the Bible. L-A-M-S-A. -A. Okay, they have it there. And in the Quran, chapter 17, verse 110, in the Surah of Baini Israel, there it says, say, call on Allah or call on the Beneficent. By whatever name you call on him, he has the best names. But we know throughout the Quran, the name is Allah, Allah. So our Jehovah Witnesses now have to come to grips and the rest of humanity, at least with the name, those who adhere to the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, that his language was Aramaic and that he used the term Allah, Allah, for God, for the divine name. And we see that we as Muslims have that same name. So we have to bring ourselves closer in unity just on the name of God. Yes. No, 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 no. That's by, uh, I think that's by Oral Robertson's uh, uh, organization, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Oral Roberts. Uh, Abundant Life Edition edit editor is Oral Roberts. Is it still possible to get that? I would assume so, yeah. This is a 1961 edition. So it's, it's, I'm sure it is. If you can and uh, that's the one that gives the Ar Aramaic yeah, name right there, as yeah. Allah. 1961 edition. Now, another situation that our Jehovah Witnesses have, they have a booklet called, Should You Believe in the Trinity? Should You Believe in the Trinity? Should You Believe in the Trinity? Then they had another track that they put out, another one of their Watchtower issues, The Supreme Being, one person or three? The Supreme Being, is he one person or three? One person or three. And in this book, on page four and page five, they say there that a biblical statement that church teachers often use to support the Trinity is Jesus' command to his followers uh, to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what they say is usually used to support the tr Trinity. Now, you know, basically in the Bible, the Trinitarian verse that's used there is 1 John 5, 7. Most of you know that uh, either from this class or just in general you know that. In the Bible, the only only real text that supports any doctrine of the Trinity proper is 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, these verses, this verse rather, has been removed from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible of 1952. 1952. So now the Jehovah Witnesses, they are happy about this as well. We're happy for them because we disagree in this Trinitarian concept. 
And we taught this class on this, uh, on this topic, and we said that Jesus never taught it. Jesus taught the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohim Adonai Ehad. Hear all the Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6, 4. And that ruled out Trinity. The Shema negates the Trinity. So Jesus taught that. So we're happy for them on that. So now they feel that they can get that out of their Bible as well. 1 John 5, 7. However, every Bible version has Matthew 19, 28 in it. I mean, Matthew 28, 19. Every Bible version that you read has Matthew 28, 19. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So now the Jehovah Witnesses are stuck with that in their Bible. <laughs> They're stuck with that. So what do they do now? How do they get around that? Because there's the Trinity now that the Christian world now is jumping on. They're jumping on that now because they know the dilemma about the other verse. So the Christian world now has turned to that verse and said this supports their doctrine of the Trinity. Now, we know that that's not correct. Basically, anybody, when you talk to them, anybody who's versed in that doctrine of Trinitarian concepts knows that those persons there in theology are spirit beings. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. This is all spirit beings. There's three that bear record where in heaven. That's Theos and, 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 uh, and Pneumaticos and uh, what's this term, uh, the Father Word? Uh, what's this word? Uh, logos. Logos, and all of these are spirit beings. Spirit beings. And then they say, the verse goes on to say, and there's three to bear reckon on, on earth, the water, the spirit, and the blood. And these three agree. So on earth, they talk about Jesus on the cross, and he, he bled, and he gave his, uh, he bled when he, when he was put on the cr cross, and they stuck him with the spear. Uh, fourth wood came blood and water, and he gave up the ghost, and he, and, and, and he said, in, and Father, into your hands I command my spirit. So that's testimony on earth. But we know that that's not spirit being, because the, uh, Jesus is a human being there. So in heaven. So now, how could Matthew 28, 19, 28, 19 be spirit beings, because we have the Son is there. You see, the Son. So someone now, someone who edited, and we've talked about this before when we talked about contradiction in the Bible, some editor has tacked on that verse on the end of Matthew 19, 28, 28, 19, in order to get two concepts there that was never taught by Jesus or any gospel writer. What was never taught was a great commission. There was never any great commission taught to Jesus. He taught a limited commission. He says, I am not sent but the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24. Matthew 10, 5, 6, go not into where the Gentiles and the city of Samaritan into you not. Matthew 10, 23, you would not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man has come. Limited commission. So now, uh, that was never taught. But the church had to teach a great commission. So they put on there, go into all the world. After Jesus now has rose from the dead, he has more authority. And he gives a greater command, they say. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, we know that when you follow the history through Acts of the Apostles, that they refused to go to all the world. And we talked about that in the class. Now, they had to also get the Trinitarian doctrine because Jesus never taught it. And no one ever taught the Trinitarian doctrine. Jesus taught that the Lord our God is one and that the, the, the Father is greater than himself and God is the only true God and everybody taught that. So they had to get that, so they put that verse there. But now the Jehovah Witnesses are stuck with it. So now they are told to baptize and they believe in baptizing. So now are they going to baptize in the formula in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Because that's the Trinitarian formula. Are they going to use that? No. Not unless they have changed, but no, they stopped using that. They say we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and what? The Spirit-filled organization. The Spirit-filled organization. That's the government, governing body. Because the governing body down at Bethel now, they represent the Holy Ghost. The governing body represents the Holy Ghost. They make decisions, you see. They inspire and they teach doctrine. So they say, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit-filled uh, 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 organization. This is the one name that they baptize in. So now, I asked them, I said, now, if that's not a Trinitarian verse, why are you afraid of it? 
So it's in your Bible still, although you teach that it's not there. So you have gotten stuck with that. And in New, New York Newsday, Saturday, October 9th, 1993, there was an article there that says Ma mass baptisms invalid. People have been being baptized and they are invalid. Boston, a Roman Catholic priest told several families that baptisms he performed were declared invalid because he uttered, he altered the wording of the Holy Trinity to delete the references to gender. He altered the wording of the Holy Trinity to, re, to delete the, word, uh, the references to gender. Instead of using the traditional Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Reverend William Larkin baptized children in the name of, of God, our Creator, through Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. God, our Creator, not the Father, not Son, you see, altered. So they say this is invalid, invalid. So we say that now, our Jehovah Witnesses brethren, and I could take this uh, topic of discussion further, but I want to cut it short because I have some f more to introduce here. I could t deal with this a little further uh, than what I'm doing, but let's get a couple other points in here. They have that problem with that trinity there. They have a book called What is the Purpose of Life? What is the Purpose of Life? See, when they give it to me, I look at it. So, wow, what is the purpose of life? Okay, I'll take that one. I have a friend of mine, <laughs> he likes to just come and give them to me because it, he, he thinks that now he's doing his work. You know, he's got a Muslim reading his literature consistently. <laughs> so, I said, okay, I'll take that one, give me that one. He's got some others. I said, no, I don't really need that, but give me this one. I'll take this one. What is the purpose of life? Now, they go on to say in, in this book there's something, first of all, some strange logic that they use here. They say, if God's purpose was to have people live in heaven like angels, why did, he, why did he not create them that way from the beginning as he did the angels? This is what he's saying. He's saying if he wanted people to live in, in heaven like angels, why didn't he just create them that way in the beginning like he did the angels? That's some strange logic because I thought, wow, this is like asking if God's purpose was to have people pass from childhood to adults, why did he not just create them that way like he did Adam and Eve? Isn't that right? He created Adam and Eve adults is what we told. So if his purpose <laughs> was to have them pass from childhood to adults, why have them go through that pro process? The same logic. And I thought that that was kind of weird, that logic. I didn't understand that, but anyway. They go on to say about this uh, situation, what is the purpose of life? Who can tell us? And then they go on to say on page six, since human philosophies and religions have, no, have not satisfactorily explained what the purpose of life is, where can we go to find out what it is? Is there a source of superior wisdom that can tell us the truth about the matter? Well, we said, yes, it's very simple. That's no big mystery here now that they're putting forth. What is it they now want, they want to indoctrinate us with something unique to them, themselves, their own teaching? We said, that's very simple to look at that. There's no need to make this whole booklet about that now. Make a fuss about that. We said, look, even in the Bible, we can find that. In the Bible, in Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 12. And Solomon there is admonishing his son. He says, by these my son be admonished. Of making many books there is no end. And much or excessive study is the weariness of the flesh. Let's hear the bottom, the conclusion of the whole matter. Let's get to the bottom line. What is the purpose of life? To worship God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God should call every man into every action into, into account. Whether it be big or whether it be small. Everything that you do will be called into account whether it's big or whether it's small. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 12. Solomon, he's a wise man. He's giving this advice to his son. Let's just read it again. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there's no end. 
and much or excessive study is the weariness of the flesh. You're just getting tired. Reading, 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 reading. He says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What's the bottom line? What are you here for? What? To fear God, meaning to worship God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You'll be judged according to your action. There's no salvation through grace. And in the Quran, we see in the Quran, chapter 51, verse 56, there again, we have the purpose of man, the creation of man. What is the purpose there? This is, وَمَا كَلَقْتُ jinna wa insa إِلَّا And I have not created the jinn and the men, but that they should worship me. That they should worship me. This is what man has been created for, to worship. And there, one commentator, he relates there, he says, Thus the innermost purpose of creation of all rational beings beings is their cogni cogni cognition of the existence of God and hence their conscious willingness to conform their, their own existence to whatever they may perceive as his will and plan. It is this twofold concept of the uh, worship of the cognition and willingness to give the deepest meaning to what the Quran describes as worship or ibadah. As the next verse shows, this spiritual call, this, this spiritual call does not arise from any supposed need on the part of the Creator. He doesn't need you to do this, who is self-sufficient and infinite in his power, but is designed as an instrument for the inner development of the worshiper, who by the act of his conscious sur self-surrender, sur sur submitting yourself to God, to the all-pervading creative, creative will, may hope to come closer to an understanding of the will and thus closer to God himself. So we see what the purpose of this whole business is, is about. And we could go further into this little dilemma of theirs as well. So I don't know what they're going to say now is the purpose of life because we already have that cleared up. We don't need any more of that. Now, they have something here. Look at this here. The Paradise Book. Do you know that there's subliminal uh, 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 drawings in here, in this book? Hidden pictures in the drawings. It's like now they're trying to seduce you with subliminal su seduction. And I was shocked to see this. I got this out of my little blue book here, this piece of information. <laughs> and I'll pass it to someone. Someone can take a look at it. We got two minutes left. Maybe we can get it in. And here's a picture right here. If you get this book from them, if you see any Jehovah Witness, they'll have one. They'll give it to you, maybe for a dollar fifty cent, or maybe for nothing. The, uh, you can uh, live it forever on Paradise Earth. And on page here, page uh, 144, in the drawing right up here, the drawing right up here, they have embedded in the picture there a human skeleton. A human skeleton. For what purposes there? We get all the information there. I don't have time to get into it now. I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to go through. I have so much stuff here to go into. And these two hours, as I explained from the outset of these classes, is just not enough time to really do justice to any of these topics, really, in my view. But hopefully it has been of some benefit to you, that you have gained something from these courses. Once again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for your participation in this class. You have contributed greatly. These classes, uh, inshallah, will be viewed by others who are not present here, not only in this society, but in other societies. And hopefully Allah will bless you all and reward you for your contribution. Jazakallah khair. Subhana rabbika rabbil izati amma yisifum. Wassalamun ala muslim. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.